Dragon's Dogma 2 is a flawed and wonderful game. The only other game that has ever had me this divided was the original Dragon's Dogma, and just like that game, this is one that I will treasure for many years, and a game that I will remember and think about often. A game that will sit in my library and I'll think about replaying it more than most, but one I'll rarely actually play again as soon as I start remembering all the bad that comes with the good. But it's also a game that I could never recommend to a friend without a long list of warnings. Chief among them, how it chooses to waste your time. With many of the games that have stuck with me, their problems all fade away when I remember my favorite moments, when I let myself wander back into their worlds through memory. No game is perfect, but the flaws of these games seem so minor in comparison, only becoming relevant to the conversation after spending an hour praising them. Even the worst flaws seem like nitpicks in the context of that conversation. With other games that have stuck with me but have larger flaws, I can recognize those flaws and mention them in my reviews or when I'm talking to friends. But their successes inspire me to fight for them despite those flaws, to push people towards playing them, hoping that others will be able to enjoy them as much as I have. But with Dragon's Dogma 2, my recommendation would be hidden underneath a long list of warnings. A list that would sound like I'm trying to keep people from playing it. Or alternatively, I could give up and say, just try it for yourself. I love this game in my own strange way. It's one of the few games that's captivated me in recent years. It has so many ideas, so many pieces that I can't let go of, and a game I couldn't stop playing. But for every moment of brilliance, for every grand surprise, for every genre and convention breaking mechanic, there's a moment of disappointment, of boredom, of annoyance. For every great idea, there's another one that's half-baked. And while I can rationalize ignoring the bad and enjoy my time with it, the moment I stop playing, I'm reminded of how much it misses, how much it lacks, and just how incomplete it can feel. And then I started back up and continue playing. But I had to stop at some point and allow myself to really think about the game, to put into words all the good and the bad it has. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to understand why this game is not only divisive in the audience it attracts, but the audience that loves it despite its plethora of flaws. So hi. I'm Mugthief, and I make videos about things I care about, and this is Dragon's Dogma 2, a very in-depth analysis. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game of constant contradiction. It feels ahead of the curve and yet way too late to the party. Unique in its design and uncompromising vision, while also being heavily inspired by other games that did everything better. It's overwhelming in complexity and still too simple. It's all of these things and all of them at the same time. Being the sequel to a game from 2012, you might have expected Dragon's Dogma 2 to take lessons from all the action, role-playing, and open-world games of the last 12 years that have pushed these formulas forward, reinterpreted them, and even redefined them. But even though the game seems aware that it's been 12 years, every change and iteration they've made is bolted onto a game that, at its core, still feels like a game from 2012. One that would have absolutely blown our minds back then, but that today feels like it's ignored parts of the last 20 years of influences and improvements made by games in the same genres. This is how it manages to be highly unique and greatly ambitious while still feeling criminally dated. At the heart of Dragon's Dogma 2, pun intended, is a blend of very complex systems that want to feel organic and emergent. A very difficult magic trick to pull off. You play as the Arisen, the one chosen by the dragon to defeat it and save the world. Probably. 
While the general plot is very high concept and so is the world, the story is very heady without ever really fulfilling the potential that its concept holds, but we'll talk about this later. As the Arisen, you will travel through the world and take on quests, many about the world and its inhabitants, and many about yourself and your role as the Arisen. You will delve into political intrigue, deception and corruption, cross-cultural borders and mend bridges, and discover your true purpose. Doing this, if you care for it and want to do so, involves a lot of running, an ungodly amount of running, fighting, sometimes too much fighting, and figuring out often clever solutions to problems that require you to pay attention to the game, which can either be very easy to do when your orders are communicated to you like you were born yesterday, or very difficult to do when the cardboard cutouts meant to be the main characters talk to you in a way that distracts you by having you wonder, what is wrong with these people? Are there robots in this universe? So allow me to explain your basic loop as you travel throughout the land. You will obtain a quest and you will run somewhere and fight some things. You will then either A. Find a way to complete your quest in the same place you're at, B. Run to a different place to complete your quest fighting along the way and then run back, or C. Run to a different place to fight something big, fight other things along the way, and then run back. In any of those moments of running, you can pause to explore off the beaten path, earning different rewards for doing so, but everything is contained within this loop, with the connecting line being your overall progress as you and your pawns get stronger, be it by leveling or by gearing. And that is the last thing I need to explain before getting to the breakdown your pawns. You're intended to always have a party of four, but the other three party members are AI-controlled pawns. These are beings that exist only to serve the Arisen and aid them in anything that the Arisen might require. Each Arisen has a dedicated pawn, one that you create, gear up, choose their vocation, everything. But Dragon's Dogma happens in a multiverse where all the other players are doing the same thing, and all of the dedicated pawns can cross into other worlds and aid other Arisen. So you will recruit pawns made by other players to round out your party, but they don't level up, so you'll be swapping them out quite often. And with this premise set up, let's talk about each part of this game piece by piece. And I want to start off on the positive side before I truly go into the things that bother me the most. And so we begin with combat. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a class-based game, although here they are called vocations. There's 10 in total, and you could consider them very similar to Monster Hunter. Each vocation uses a unique weapon type, and they all play completely different. Your character levels up, generally improving stats like strength, health, and stamina. But your vocation ranks up as well, using a separate experience point system to unlock new skills. There's a variety of skills to choose from, but you can only have four equipped at a time. Leveling up a vocation also grants access to passive skills called augments that can be equipped regardless of your current vocation, incentivizing you to level them all up to create your ideal character with those passives. There's no resources to manage in terms of mana or durability on armor or weapons or even ammo in most cases. All you manage is your stamina, which drains when doing certain actions and skills, but not when doing basic attacks and combos, although it will regenerate slower when doing those. Within combat, there is no lock on targeting, only soft targeting on both melee and ranged, which removes the circle strafing combat of other games and instead leads to a much more freeform and brawly mess, striking this balance of chaos and control with spectacular feedback on every hit from every vocation. From the warrior's huge swings that really sell the weight of the attacks, to the archer's charged up shots, the speed and cool factor of the thief nimbly dashing around, or the visual feast of colors and effects from each spell that a sorcerer casts. There's so much to discover and love. And if you're ever bored of a playstyle, no matter how satisfying it might be, you can always change to a different vocation. You can always switch and you will always find something in those vocations to enjoy. Since combat mechanics have been expanded on so greatly from the first game, each vocation has added depth to them, 
Warriors can time button presses for extra speed. Thieves are the only ones that can dodge. Sorcerers can trade their stamina in order to encant spells faster. Magic archers have two different targeting systems that they can switch between. Every little quirk of your vocation is then put to the test when facing the larger monsters as you take advantage of their weaknesses and use your vocation's strengths to deal the most damage from your unique arsenal of abilities. But just because they're all fun, doesn't mean they're all equal. All the vocations can be built to be overpowered, partially because of the enemies you fight, which are just a little bit too easy, although we'll talk about that later, but some vocations are more overpowered than others. The Mystic Spearhand boasts physical and magic damage to cover all foe's weaknesses, while having incredible mobility and sustained damage no matter the opponent. With easy access to weak points, range damage options, and a skill that with proper stamina management can make you and your entire party immune forever. The Thief more selfishly has a skill that automatically dodges any damage that they would have received at the cost of stamina, entering an empowered state that reminds me of Dual Blade's demon mode from Monster Hunter. And once again, with proper stamina management, they can deal exceptional damage completely safe, while also having the highest possible damage when climbing on the monsters. The Magic Archer holds great advantages over regular archers, with the way that their arrows only require a lock-on procedure and they have access to all sorts of elemental damage. On the opposite side, you have things like the Mage and Sorcerer, which can feel too dependent on your party taking aggro, making them susceptible to stunlock and high damage, while never finding the room to encant their spells. The Warrior, with its long wind-up animations, can similarly struggle, outputting less damage and with much more effort required to do so. The Fighter, with their defensive capabilities, have the ability to take aggro and are more suited to letting your pawns do the work, which is something that can be very hit or miss, and it's very similar to the Trickster, which is also in this support position. As an Arisen-only vocation, it cannot do any damage, and instead can distract or empower your pawns for them to do more. But this all requires your pawns to work correctly. And to be fair, they work decently well. Sometimes they go off and destroy enemies, sometimes they watch you get beaten to a bloody pulp. Their inclinations, which are their personalities, factor into their behavior, and sometimes they can just be dumb. You could be knocked out, five meters away from the fight, and spamming the help command, and a pawn will walk up to you, and instead of helping you up, they will stand next to you and cast a spell at the monster, and that can be infuriating. It's those moments when they're unreliable that make it really difficult to build a playstyle around supporting the pawns. They and other NPCs can get stuck on terrain, their pathfinding can break, and they'll run into a wall for minutes on end. They can jump off cliffs for no reason, and they can make strange decisions in combat that sometimes prove funny and other times prove annoying. But the overall satisfaction provided by all these systems in combat never really wears off. It never truly gets old. Every button press, every smack, every lightning bolt makes you feel powerful. The physics and animation work beautifully, and everything is communicated visually to make these systems easy to understand. Grand strikes send enemies flying off cliffs or into other enemies. The way you stagger and knock down enemies after repeated hits feels logical despite not having any meters to show this progress. When you smash an enemy shield with a warrior swing, you don't think about their hidden posture or stagger bar. You think, damn, this guy is really holding his own. And when the next swing breaks that guard, you could intuit that result before swinging, just as you could intuit when it wouldn't break it on other vocations. The power of each attack is conveyed through these physics, these animations, and these effects, so that despite there sometimes being an over-reliance on combat as the main method of interacting with the game, the combat itself never gets boring. And that is very surprising, because the game tries really hard to make it boring. I already touched on how often you'll be in combat, but one of the main problems with combat is the low variety of enemies. For a game that places this much emphasis and playtime on combat, low variety hurts much more than in other games 
that have many other systems to offset that lack of variety. The repetition of enemy types and subsequent combat loop against those enemies makes it feel like Diablo. Not because of its systems, it's obviously a very different game, but because the game expects you to be excited over and over again while doing the same attacks against the same enemies. It's a testament to the quality of combat in Dragon's Dogma 2. To every detail of that weight, the hit stun, the physics, they all contribute to making the game fun for hours on end, despite this repetition. And with this, it is also a great improvement in many ways over the first game. It does have less enemy types than the first one, and the only thing I still don't like is how we've gone from being able to equip six skills down to four, by adding an additional vocation action that is always mapped to R1 or the right bumper. And if you simply looked at the skills and enemies on display, you might be fooled into thinking that combat isn't a big departure from the original Dragon's Dogma, or even a downgrade. But every small addition here, be that graphical glow-up or the vocation mechanics, means that even if it's just an iterative upgrade, combat feels better overall, even if it does end up falling into some of the same pitfalls. But Dragon's Dogma 2 still finds ways to screw that up. The enemy variety is very important, since the tools you have are only as valuable as the things you have to use them on. So this is what the game gives you to work with. There's goblins, which include small and large, as well as stealth ones, and then there's batal variants from the second region. But all of these are goblins, and they all really work the same. There's humans, and these can be warriors, thieves, or sorcerers, basically think enemy pawns. Then there's saurians, which come in the normal variety, as well as asps, which are toxic, and the rocky magma scales, and these are at least fairly different between them, but they're all still big lizards. There's a variety of skeletons and zombies to fight at night, but skeletons feel like reskinned humans, or I guess de-skinned in this case, and undead are either the very basic zombie or the one that explodes. You also have harpies, which come in many different elemental variants, but all function the same, and that's very similar to oozes that also come in many elemental variants. Beyond these, you have the large monsters. These are the monsters with big health bars that appear up top, kind of indicating that they are boss fights. These are Cyclops, Ogres, Griffins, Chimera, Dullahans, Skeleton Lords, Liches, Drakes, Worms, Golems, and Minotaurs. All of these have slightly powered up versions, except the Cyclops, which is lacking the Gore Cyclops from Dark Arisen, and there's two unique bosses in the Medusa, which respawns in its cave, and the Sphinx, which is a boss fight you're not meant to fight, but it does exist as a fight, and we'll talk about this later. I also only fought the Skeleton Lord once, but I, I want to believe that there are more of them. Now this might seem like a large list, but the truth is that the fodder quickly falls in line with repetition across the general types, and the large monsters, listed as a total of 13, are what you will fight potentially hundreds of times throughout a playthrough, with some enemies very overrepresented, and others being barely used, like that Medusa or the Sphinx. And it takes very little for these bosses to quickly turn into a time sink, as they will rarely prove threatening. They each have a very simple weakness to exploit, and unless you get stunlocked by engaging in a fight that includes other enemies at the same time, you'll rarely encounter any trouble after you're level 15 or 20 for the first area of Vermont, and around level 30 to 35 for the second area of Batal. The only exception to this is the post-game, and its versions of monsters and general spread, which will demand a bit more gear and precision if you want to make it out unscathed. In the original Dragon's Dogma, there are small touches like the reuse of the griffin to create the cockatrice, but this cockatrice is accompanied by different spells and attack patterns that make it feel distinct while reusing certain assets and rigs. And I would have been happy to see more of this in Dragon's Dogma 2, but instead the leveled up versions of the monsters are basically slightly more aggressive and with a bit more health. But nothing significantly changes your plan, or has you swapping out your party to counter them. This leads to an overall difficulty level that's very low once you've got your feet on the ground, reinforcing the feeling of repetition and time wasting. This is an iterative improvement, and not even in its totality. What isn't very iterative, and instead is completely transformative, is the open world and its design. 
This will probably be the largest section of this video, and while I won't dive into the post-game spoilers just yet, be warned that some surprises might be talked about in this section. I'll make sure to leave chapter markers for those of you who want zero spoilers to identify and skip them. There has been a lot of discourse and criticism thrown at Dragon's Dogma 2, and as you'll see soon enough, that's because there is plenty to criticize. However, one of the criticisms I just don't agree with is how it's simply Dragon's Dogma 1 again, or Dragon's Dogma 1, but worse. It's true that many parts of this game feel like a more fully realized version of the vision presented in the first game, but by and large, in its priorities and changes, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game that reaches for the same goals as the first, but in completely different ways. The best example of this comes from the open world. Dragon's Dogma 1 was a game that had an open world as a means of connecting its content. The different dungeons and quest locations that were the true meat of the game needed a context to connect them, but the game could have been fast travel points or a level select menu and lost very little in the process. Much of that open world was a series of hallways, with some of the hallways of that open world feeling like their own mini dungeons. This is because you would enter areas that had no connection to the wider open world, while still technically being part of it. They had clear entry and exit points with no other connecting routes, making their design feel much more like a game level than a naturalistic open world. This wasn't always the case, there were a few small areas containing an additional fight to experience, and the existence of the open world did help create a sense of place for the world of Grancis while adding easier options for farming and, of course, padding out the runtime as you navigate through what is a generally barren, uninteresting open world. Its biggest problem, though, was how all of those meaningful locations the game wanted to show you were always signposted. While it was perfectly possible for you to set out and explore the world of Grancis and then stumble into cool dungeons and areas with surprises and loot, doing so would eventually lead to you being punished. Everything noteworthy to explore in Dragon's Dogma was connected to a quest. You might not have found that quest. You might have skipped over it without noticing. You might have just not cared enough to talk to the NPCs. But at some point, someone would ask you to head to each location and do something there. I mention this is punishing because if you explored those areas beforehand and then got sent back, you would just be repeating often very tedious content and in its entirety, with no shortcuts to be found. Sure, you could gain some extra experience, but you're also slowly walking all the way back to that same location to do the same dungeon again. This is what makes it very clear that while parts of Dragon's Dogma were technically missable, the game did its best to guide you to its best parts and they were not the open world, but the locations within it. This is where Dragon's Dogma 2 differs, but not entirely. Much of the world's design still feels like hallways, just many, many more hallways with branching paths that sometimes contain real opportunities to break out of them. You still run the risk of repeating content, but some of that blow is softened by design that has you unlocking shortcuts around the open world and within dungeons. The biggest difference is that lack of signposting. An enormous amount of content in this game is completely optional. There's many ways to complete quests, and there's paths available to circumvent every roadblock that the main quest presents. You can start the game and reach the end point, ignoring most quests if you know how to navigate the world. And most importantly, a majority of that optional content feels rewarding to explore because it is completely optional. The developer said that Dragon's Dogma 2 was approximately four times the size of Dragon's Dogma when it came to the open world. In my opinion, that wasn't underselling it. It's whatever the word is for more than underselling. While the square meters used to measure this map might be four times larger theoretically, and even then I think it's more than that, it's how many more branching paths and hallways combined with dungeons, buildings, and caves all across the map, as well as the expanded enemy density, pack the map to the brim with different things. Even the largest roads have different paths parallel to them that you can take, and that will put you in winding caves that lead to different exits with some new loot. 
And although everything I just said might sound very positive, and there is indeed much to love about this new approach to open world design that the team has embraced, we haven't gotten to the issues that it presents. And this is a theme that's present when talking about these two games, the original Dragon's Dogma and the second one, where many of the flaws from the first are corrected by the second. But every new thing that the second introduces comes with flaws just as deep and divisive as the first. This massive open world is one of, if not the largest problem, that holds Dragon's Dogma 2 back from greatness. And it can be divided into three separate issues regarding the design of the open world, and those are traversal, variety, and reactivity. Traversal, or put in less fancy terms, movement is an essential part of every video game that includes moving a character on a screen. Whether it's in 2D or 3D spaces, whenever a game has you moving, you're probably going to do it a lot. And that's even more important in games with big worlds. The different ways that games approach movement and implementing mechanics to make that movement satisfying and engaging to the player is one of my favorite parts of video game design. But wait, wait, wait a second. Hey, what's that music? Hey, Mug Sauce, Mug Thief here. What exactly is player engagement? The use of the word engagement, before commonly used for contractual agreements including that of marriage, fell in disuse for years until it resurged in large part thanks to its use in video games and in user experience design. Its most common definition today when speaking about those is something that creates an emotional involvement or commitment, and in the world of games it means that it's something that you actively interact with and want to interact with. To me, there are few things worse in design than a video game not being engaging. This does not mean that a game needs to constantly bombard you with information, colors, or dopamine fixes. Quite the contrary. It's been proven in psychology that an overexposure to these things reduces engagement, meaning that things that we normally associate with the term are actually a way of creating apathy. When I refer to the term engagement, I refer to it as something that elicits a response within the player of them wanting to engage with the game. With proper context around it, a blank screen can be engaging if it comes as a surprise to the player, where they then wait, filled with expectation, and what comes next. A walking simulator can be engaging if the game has created an atmosphere where the audiovisual information being given is interesting or even required to progress. Staring at puzzles in The Witness for three hours is engaging because I'm thinking about how to solve the puzzle. I am literally engaging with the game, even if I'm not interfacing with it. Open world games have resorted to many different tricks in order to maximize engagement from the player. Much like the example of overly colorful loot pinatas, Ubisoft games and their commonly criticized over-reliance on 7,000 markers and notifications to communicate just how many things you can do and how close they are can turn around and make everything seem pointless. But in games like Red Dead Redemption 2, a game often cited for how it communicates its calm, contemplative nature, there's plenty of tricks being employed to carefully perfect that engagement. From observing the world to better identify the optimal route, to a random event that occurs on the road, to you being reminded to pay attention to your surroundings because you never know when a rare animal might be lurking nearby that you need to complete a side quest. Dragon's Dogma 2's open world, unfortunately, fails at being engaging and for very long stretches of time. And while there's many reasons for that lack of engagement, the first one that I want to talk about is its traversal mechanics. When looking at other open world RPGs, we can see how each of them tackles the problem of traversal and engagement. Some RPGs opt for making traversal something that never lasts more than a mere 30 seconds between different points of interest, like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Others opt for making traversal the core of the game, like Tears of the Kingdom, which offers a breadth, pun intended, of different traversal options, from gliding to shield surfing to climbing and of course, building your own unique contraption for transportation that turns the entire world into a puzzle and a playground at once. On a different side of the spectrum, a side much closer to Dragon's Dogma 2, Elden Ring offers the option of the mount, while also being a game where the points of interest are never more than 30 seconds apart, and if they are, 
it offers alternative methods to skip that travel if you wanted to. Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Valhalla offer mounts and ships and other things, but they also have a series of mechanics directly connected to movement, with climbing and jumping as ways to keep moment-to-moment -moment movement engaging. Heck, we can even just move to battle royales, where slide cancelling and Call of Duty or Apex offer you a skill to master in terms of inputs and timing that improves your speed in games that by their nature require you to always be engaged and paying attention. But that small wrinkle to the movement mechanics is the extra distraction you need to practice when there's even the slightest downtime. Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't follow any of these and instead is more similar to a Bethesda Game Studios game. It's like wandering the open worlds of Starfield. While it's true that there are many branching paths and secrets to explore, Dragon's Dogma 2 has a clear philosophy centered around not having fast travel. This means that, especially if you decide to do a lot of side content, you will spend obscene amounts of time traveling up and down the same roads. Roads you've explored before. Roads that no longer hold secrets to explore. The only distraction is combat, which as I've said, does remain entertaining. But as you level up and get stronger, it also becomes mindless. There's no chance that you lose. You could even choose to not participate and your pawns would win for you after a certain point. And so you wander up and down these roads with the only thing that requires thought or management being your stamina as you stop sprinting and wait for that to refill so you can sprint again for hours at a time. Sure, between these sessions, you might reach town and turn in a quest to do some shopping, switch your gear. But then for the next 15 minutes, you run down a road with nothing but now mindless combat to break up the monotony. And this gets worse as the game progresses. At the start, when you have those secrets to uncover, this isn't much of a problem. At the start, many combat scenarios can still test your metal and have you tense, thinking on your feet, and many times the enemies can be completely new and very intimidating. But as you fill out the map, see all the enemies there are and get stronger, it just gets worse and worse. It's like crossing a Bethesda Game Studios map that you've already filled out without using fast travel. It might have a romantic ring to it, the long, solitary journey through these enchanting worlds, but that really only works when the world has been carefully designed around that, and neither Bethesda's worlds nor Dragon's Dogma 2 have been. This is why we fast travel in Skyrim and Fallout. This is why the loop in those games is the journey to unlock those fast travel points as we explore. This is why a game like Dragon's Dogma 2, that has those same general traversal options as Skyrim or Fallout, which is to say, holding a direction on an analog stick, but doesn't have fast travel easily accessible, turns into an infuriating slog. For satisfying as the combat is and how cool the combos are, the truth is that just like those Bethesda games, Combat becomes a meaningless and annoying obstacle when you just want to reach the next objective. Except that in Fallout or Elder Scrolls, if you're not fast traveling, you're traveling to somewhere new, and that keeps you looking forward to your destination. In Dragon's Dogma 2, you're just walking down the same road, fighting wave after wave of the same enemies. And in the division between the start and the end of the game, it becomes worse. That beginning, where all that exploration, tension, and surprise accompany you each time you set out in the world, can be truly magical. Within its limitations, within its lack of traversal mechanics or its hallway-like design, you're filled with a childlike wonder at an exploration experience that captures what I've always had in my imagination to be a real adventure. And slowly, that awe and wonder turns into tedium. And this is how the game wants this to be. Its fast travel is locked behind a rare and expensive consumable, and gated by the placement of fast travel points that are limited. The only reusable, easily accessible fast travel option are ox carts. They take in-game time to use, they only connect four points on the map, and they can be raided by enemies. The first time that your trip is interrupted by enemies, and in that combat the ox cart is broken, 
you might be surprised at how the systems in the game interact, leaving you stranded to finish the journey on foot. This is a memorable anecdote, something you won't forget. The sixth time this happens, however, you'll be annoyed at how your options are reduced to holding the left stick again for 10 minutes without engagement, or how you are now wasting precious consumables just to finish half of a trip because you want to get your current quest done. A trip that could have already had you taking an ox cart from one place to another and resting in order to get onto the next ox cart because they only leave in the morning and then that final leg of the trip to be interrupted by a raid. And now you have to walk those last 10 minutes in absolute darkness and occasionally press the X button to dispatch enemies that couldn't hurt you even if you decided to throw your controller out the window and take a three hour nap in the middle of combat. This is the tedium that this game promises. And for me, one of the main ways of addressing this problem is with traversal. If just the act of moving throughout the world were fun, the issue would be mitigated. If something like mounts were accessible for the main roads after an unlock condition were met, at the point when you really aren't looking to fight these enemies anymore, and maybe some form of mounted combat that allowed you to quickly deal with the lowest rank of enemies. Much of this could have been avoided. If there were different movement and traversal mechanics in place to keep each trip a little different, or if the open world were less funneled into hallways, adding a little bit of extra freedom as you move through it, maybe this could have been avoided. Have I ever mentioned how much I love shield surfing in Zelda on this channel? I don't think so, right? But you get my point. There's nothing to aid the player in engagement after a certain point in the game when repetition sets in. And this is in a game where traversal is a core feature of the experience. What proves how little the developers care for making this experience engaging to the player is found in Batal's lifts. There's a series of pulleys with platforms connecting different areas of Batal, and you can use them. You climb up to them, stand in them, and either rotate the stick to make them move, or have a pawn do it. While moving, you can be attacked by harpies, but the trip from one end to the other can run over five minutes, during which the act of traversal is limited to rotating a stick or letting a pawn handle traversal while you stand still, only pressing X when attacked. Even worse, the lifts might not be where you are, they can be on the other end of Batal, making you rotate the stick to move them back to where you are, effectively doubling the time it takes to use them while not adding any engagement to the process. An entire additional system of traversal is in this region, and it's purposefully made to be extremely boring, meaning that they understood the problem. They added alternatives, but made sure the experience was worse than running, making the already tedious options better by contrast. The second large problem is variety. There's not much of it visually or in combat once you're in the groove, and instead there's quite a lot of it in the design of the world, but not in a good way. Dragon's Dogma 2 can be divided into three acts, spread across three regions. If we're being technical, there's more than three depending on how you want to slice it, but in broad strokes there is Vermond, Batal, and the Volcanic Island. And if you want to get extra technical, there's, um, <laughs> Dragon's Dogma 2. Each of these zones is very distinct in landscape, atmosphere, culture, and dungeons, but not very distinct within those clear-cut biomes. They get better as the game goes on and also worse but the variation of each next zone is hampered by a lack of new enemies to fill them. This is a graph of my experience on my first playthrough of Dragon's Dogma 2. The giant dip here is when I got absolutely sick of exploring Vermund, the first region. The huge climb is how amazing I thought most of my time in Batal was, followed by another dip before heading into the volcanic island, which is much shorter and then the grand surprise, which is almost short enough to not wear out its welcome, although it is time limited, kind of, and it's a whole section marked with spoilers later in the video. Each of these acts have very different design philosophies to accompany them. 
Vermond, with its sea of green, feels like a more traditional Skyrim-like adventure. There's a lot of roads, a lot of corners, and exploration is the closest to naturalistic here. You will explore mountains and valleys and beaches as you run from town to town in Melv, Arv, and the capital Vernworth, as well as spend time in Checkpoint Rest Town. And there's a large amount of side quests and detailed locations to explore, including things like the Sphinx, which we'll get into when we talk quests. Batal and its sandy red rock canyons feels much more condensed and also varied. The contrast of reds, greens, and blues piques your interest more than the eventually monotone greens of Vermond, and the world design changes into something that feels closer to the original dragon's dogma. There's still a good amount of optional locations and caves in Batal, but also larger, more intricately designed dungeons, as well as some bigger landmarks like Medusa's Cave or the Berbiglio Mines. Batal reminds me more of the original Dragon's Dogma in how a hallway leads to a longer environment that might even transition into a cave. Together, these areas feel more like a dungeon made up of naturalistic elements. In Vermond, these main paths might lead to a cave, but the caves are all kind of the same, spinning you back out onto that same path, or a tangential path if you're lucky when you make it through. The exceptions to this being settlements like the Sacred Arbor of the Elves or the Nameless Village. This doesn't mean that Batal's design is strictly better, since we fall into the same pitfalls from before. Some of these dungeon-like locations lack alternate ways out or shortcuts, so for the positive of being larger and more fleshed out, they also have you running all the way out the same way you come in. But it's also, in my opinion, a much more interesting design and middle ground. Agamemnon Volcanic Island, the biome of the third act, is basically three hallways with an optional side quest dungeon. It's very straightforward, but pads out its runtime with a large list of quests from Acts 1 and 2. These quests, beginning in Bakbatal and even Vernworth, have you trek all the way to the island and back again, and given what I've said about fast travel and the engagement of traversing the map, you know how much I think this is some of the worst design ever put into an open world game. The one thing Dragon's Dogma 2 taught me about open world design was that we need to appreciate Tears of the Kingdom more. For a game that has received plenty of criticism for being an expansion to Breath of the Wild, the way it nails its balance in variety, traversal, engagement, and complexity of the things you explore and its questlines, and the amount of content, it's not just an enormous quantity, but of enormous quality and thoughtful design throughout. It has its issues with enemy variety and weapon durability, among other things, but Tears of the Kingdom is a masterclass in comparison, and I couldn't help but be consistently reminded of it when playing Dragon's Dogma 2. Looking out into the beautiful skyboxes and mountains in the distance of Dragon's Dogma 2, I remembered that in Zelda, not only were those locations real places I could reach, but I wasn't constrained to slowly running around down the same hallways or forced to interface with unengaging mechanics over and over again. Dragon's Dogma 2 has shown me, in hindsight, just how impressive Tears of the Kingdom is from a design perspective. And it's a perfect example to talk about the third problem. Reactivity and reward structure. While the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 has its list of pros, reactivity is not on that list. This world feels consistently dead and robotic. NPCs, their schedules, store restocks, and almost every line of dialogue is predictable, formulaic, and boring. It really shows how this game is one of extremes. For a game where the gorgeous effects of combat can have grass sway and react to convey the weight of a massive swing as an enemy falls to the ground, it also feels startlingly dead, to the point that I think this might be the next setting for Westworld. Quests and their solutions can be interesting, but only in the way they utilize the existing systems. Quests and their NPCs don't react to the world around them, making the experience feel much like everything else in the game, great at the start, but quickly fading into depressing lows once that uniqueness disappears. 
NPCs and their meaningless dialogue are not just rote and robotic, they're a wasted opportunity. There is little to no environmental storytelling in the game, and little to no storytelling outside of the main quest. NPCs never talk about anything that impacts the game world. Nor do they hint at rumors, potential quests, or interesting locations. What is even worse is how they don't even talk about the game world or its state. Much of the world feels created for you to be in it. Nobody talks about what the world is like, gently communicating information about this land, or show the difference of culture within the regions. Nobody talks about what the world was like before you came into it. They don't acknowledge large changes or story beats and are content with repeating their same routines until the events of the story rip them out of their homes, and not even all of them. Shops never close, even at night. Solving a crucial quest upon which the existence of a race depends on is something only you and the quest giver know about, since nobody in the town will ever mention it. Your pawns try to fill in this void, commenting on the circumstances of your adventure. Sometimes they harp about a ladder or a chest, and in other cases they'll mention rumors they've heard around town. But when? When are my pawns overhearing conversations that I never hear? And what about these rumors of changes in Vermin's military? They're not impactful. This information is shown to us in a cutscene shortly after arriving at Vernworth, but it's never brought up by the townsfolk. It's something that I heard in a quest by a member of the military. So where are my pawns hearing these rumors that they picked up around town? Beyond that, locations themselves never have a story to tell. Even the most intricate caves and dungeons simply exist as generic set design. There are chests to open in these caves, placed there by the goblins or saurian that inhabit them, I guess. There are keys to vaults in the city that are hidden in ancient castles miles away. But there's no connecting line as to why that key is there and what that has to do with the vault in the city. The few times that the game attempts to give context to the world is exclusively within quests. Like the Coral Snakes, a band of bandits and their hideout. The game even explains why they've chosen to make this place their base of operations, though it's just an expository dump that says, this is why, please don't ask. Which to me is just funny, considering the game never wants you to ask questions or expect answers. Its entire shtick is that things are the way they are, and you just accept that and move on. And this, once again, gets worse over time. At the start of the game, the tutorial areas try to give purpose to characters, to the arisen, and why things are the way they are. The game front loads its setting, creating questions about the world that it never intends to answer. And all pretenses that it would be a more traditional, stronger narrative are dropped after reaching Vernworth a short while later. During that same magical period when everything is frightening and new, the design of Vermund enhances the rewarding feeling of exploration. You gain levels quickly, and each level you gain matters. Every piece of gear or consumable you find as a reward from exploring feels impactful as you equip it with pride and test it out in combat. But over time, you'll realize that the explorations of yet another cave in the dead world it inhabits will reward you with some piece of gear that is ultimately meaningless. The cave or dungeon itself isn't interesting, often boiling down to rooms of combat with nothing to figure out beyond clearing each fork in the road, and 90% of the time the gear reward won't be as good as what you have, or it'll be for a vocation you're not using. You could argue that gear for other vocations encourages you to try it out, but you quickly learn that whenever you're ready to try out that new vocation, you're able to buy a whole new set of better gear from the vendor in town with the vast amounts of gold you come across. Once the game transitions from the player being unable to afford a single piece of good gear, to them being able to afford anything and everything, rewards for exploration never adapt into items that are worth finding. 
This takes away one of the only motivations for exploring, since the exploration itself, as we've talked about, isn't fun or engaging enough once you see the writing on the walls. And this ends up hurting the game in a way that proves almost fatal. And this is one of the most interesting and annoying parts of Dragon's Dogma 2. A game not only of ups and downs, but a game that feels like its design has a foot in 2012 and a foot in 2024. Having learned from many other games, but not enough to feel current while staying true to their vision. Instead of finding clever ways to bolster the vision of the design with the games that came before it, the open world really puts its issues on display throughout its disparate, yet still connected, designs of each act. And this trend will continue to every other aspect of the game, because now we need to talk about questing. I will dive into the story proper once we reach the spoiler section of the video, but you should know that the main quest of this game is this. As the Arisen, you are to defeat the dragon and take the throne of Vernward. In this, the main quest has you progress to Batal, and later, Agamemnon. You can skip the direct route and go to these places early, or ignoring the main quest, but you'll always be forced into the main quest route before reaching the end of the game. And I mention this to give perspective on how quest lines are spaced out throughout the three acts and how they're meant to be tackled depending on your progress in the main quest. Everything I've said about the dead world still applies to quests. The interactions that you have and the motivation for doing them is as thin as it can be. But the quests themselves are presented in a way that I wish would be done in other games. Aside from the main quest, you will rarely get an indicator that something is a quest. There are no exclamation markers above NPC heads here. You'll have to speak to people, approach locations, and generally poke your nose where you probably aren't wanted to initiate a quest. This lends a feeling to the world that reminds of immersive sims, where prodding different corners of the world can lead to discoveries which open alternate paths, goals, and rewards. A great example of this is Glendwyr, an elf you can find perusing the weapon shop in Vernworth. When approached, he will explain how he's curious about human bows, but can't bring himself to purchase one. Gifting him one will lead him to ask if you could show him how to use it, and after some back and forth, he will lead you to the Sacred Arbor, the City of Elves, to accompany him in his archery trial, and leading to some extra quests. If you never talk to him, you might never see this location, unless there's some alternative skip in order to enter it, Although, you still will come here during the post-game regardless, but that is a very changed version of the Arbor. Hiding these long quest lines, many of which span the entirety of the game world, behind what would otherwise be innocuous interactions, means that there's a genuine curiosity to what each quest presents and what they could lead to. A curiosity that, much like everything else in Dragon's Dogma 2, fades after time whenever a quest ends up being disappointing. The overall quality of quests goes down, as quest lines from the start prolong into the second and third acts, and as more of them lead to inconsequential fluff. The Regalia Sword, another quest that can start in Verdworth, has you traveling to Batal, speaking to a blacksmith in order to repair the Regalia Sword, engaging in a quest line with some more tasks to complete, and then finishing it up in Agamemnon near the end of the game, to have you go back to Batal to pick up the sword and then bring it back to Vernworth. All of this in order to get 30,000 gold and some experience. You might have thought you'd get some unique gear or maybe get to use the repaired sword, but no. It's a meaningless interaction for some dude who likes the sword and says it matters for you to take the throne, but it doesn't. It doesn't matter. And it feels like you wasted your time for even thinking about this throughout the game because you have no investment in this character or in this sword, and it won't impact anything. There's one exception to this, and that is the Sphinx, a beautifully designed, animated and voiced creature that you can find hiding in the mountains north of Checkpoint Rest. The Sphinx presents you with 10 riddles that you need to solve to receive different rewards, and they can be clever and engaging, partially because of how hidden and completely optional they are and partially because they can be failed and lock you out of their rewards. The quest structure, however, can be seen as a little hostile. There's quite a lot to complain about, especially quests like the Riddle of Rumination, 
which has you return to the location of the first Seeker token you picked up, which are small collectibles hidden across the world. And it gives you an in-game time limit of seven days to find it in return, so I hope you remember where that token was, and I hope you didn't have any other important timed quests. The Sphinx, through its presentation and its structure, commands the player's attention. Which is good, because its rewards beyond some of the first riddles are disappointing, except for the very last one, hidden behind a separate puzzle. The Sphinx teases the player with a large ornate chest unlike any other in the game, but upon completing all of her riddles, she doesn't reward you with it, flying away instead as part of her deal with you. The secret to this final puzzle is to make sure you're an archer, that's the first step, or have access to a bow as a warfarer, and then engage in combat with the Sphinx after completing the last riddle but before she flies away. You can't take down the Sphinx, though. If her life bar gets too low, she will just leave. This is why you need to be an archer to make use of the Unmaking Arrow, an item that instantly kills an enemy, and one the Sphinx herself gives you as a reward in her second set of riddles. Once you're in combat, that is to say, once her life bar appears, hitting her with the Unmaking Arrow will have her drop the sagacious key to open the chest, granting you the eternal wake stone. This stone will allow you to revive everyone who has died in a large vicinity around the player, say an entire city, and it exists to counter the Dragon's Plague. The Dragon's Plague itself is a brilliant idea, if like much else in the game, half-baked in its execution. Pawns can contract a virus from other pawns known as Dragon's Plague when they're traveling beyond the rift and if they're infected with it, they will start to show symptoms through their animations and even disobey commands you give them. If you don't remedy the plague by either dismissing the pawn or by throwing your pawn off a cliff or letting them die in combat, as soon as you rest at an inn, you will wake to find everyone dead as your pawn transformed into a dragon and massacred every NPC in the city. Some of this surprise and its puzzle is ruined by how the game gives you a pop-up tutorializing the Dragon's Plague the first time you enlist a pawn that has it, kind of giving up the ghost right off the bat. I can only assume playtests had people very angry without this hint. The concept, however, is brilliant. It's risky, but it's such an exciting idea, a concept that truly embodies the idea of actions and consequences where failing to pay attention can lead to an entire city and its quests being wiped. Except not really. Main quests, or essential characters rather, will simply respawn after an in-game week if they die, although you will lose out on characters relevant to side quests, requiring you to revive them with wake stones or, even better, the eternal wake stone. I wish there was more follow-through with the Dragon's Plague and just in general with many ideas the game has. The realization that the main quest is required to progress, and because of that, the characters respawn. And to me, that goes completely contrary to this philosophy of consequences. I wish the entire game had a way to be completed without any quests, and that the main quest could be completely ruined by something like the Dragon's Play. But instead, it's just another cool idea that can lead to unique experiences, but not any real lasting consequences. This is another example of the game having these brilliant concepts that it wants to explore but failing to execute them in any meaningful way. Unfortunately, it's a case of one good idea shining brightly in a sea of terrible design. The good being that the quests are presented in a way we rarely see, with answers that are often as unique as that presentation. But the quest's characters, pacing, and reliance on traveling across the world bog down the whole experience. Even attempting to quest optimally by collecting every quest possible in an area before proceeding be very difficult to pull off, on top of just reminding you of their bad design. Fast travel could fix some of these issues, but the entire model is at odds with itself. The open world design has you exploring the land and in wonder and glee, meaning any quests that are in faraway places fade into the background as something to do when you reach that next town. They become afterthoughts, rather than functioning as the main driver for you to move. 
By the time you get to the quest, you're moving sluggishly through a world you've already seen to fight monsters you've already fought and receive rewards that no longer matter. I guess I'm just quoting Tyler Durden at this point. But without a doubt, the worst part of Dragon's Dogma 2 and its questing is how there is no motivation to actually pursue the quests. You don't want to solve them for the characters or to change the state of the world or because of the rewards you receive. There is no reason for you to do these things except the fact that they are in front of you. Which is also the same reason that you would see the story through to its conclusion. So I guess it's time to dive into the story and the post-game. Spoiler warnings for this entire chapter of the video. And I think that matters, since at the time of writing this, only 5% of players on Steam have made it to the post-game, let alone the under 1% that have seen the true ending. This is the first time, ever, since I've made videos, that I have a lot to say on the story of a game. Because it's an area where Dragon's Dogma 2, to me, is straight up worse than the original. It's more ambitious and creative than the first, especially in how it represents things in gameplay, but a much worse story. The story of Dragon's Dogma 2 is, at its core, the same as Dragon's Dogma's. This is a story of fate, faith, and godhood, where the main beats are the same across both. The major players are three, the Seneschal, the Arisen, and the Dragon, and together they form the Cycle. In this game, there's a fourth player added, being the Brine, which I previously called in my Dragon's Dogma retrospective a nice guy. Well, not anymore. The Brine is the evil thing that lives in the water and sucks you in and respawns you if you touch it. The core ideas of the franchise, I guess, now that there's two games, is that this world has a god which rules over all. It sees everything and controls everything, and most importantly, it creates the dragon. And the dragon chooses Arisens until one of them can slay it. The hook in Dragon's Dogma was seeing the impact of Arisens that failed to slay the dragon and the impact they had on the world. Or in a broader sense, the impact that each element of this never-ending cycle had on that world. The purpose of the cycle was simple. Arisens fight dragons, and if they win, they meet the Seneschal. They then fight the Seneschal, and if they kill them, they become the new Seneschal. But if they die, they become the new dragon. It's an endless hunt for a new god to feed their energy into the world, a necessity for maintaining order, and the interesting parts of the world are around those who failed or found what they considered a different success. In Dragon's Dogma 2, the figure of the Arisen and how this cycle impacts the world is greatly expanded. The Arisen is treated as the monarch of Vermund, while considered a bad omen in Batal. The power of the dragon, the power to control pawns, is given to the Arisen and reproduced in the Godsway, an artificial magic at the center of the political struggle of Vernwur. The Dragon's Plague is another expression of this power. These concepts are more fleshed out than in Dragon's Dogma, but the cycle itself appears to be the same on the surface, with some key differences. Here, the Seneschal is not portrayed as a former Arisen, nor are they hinted at from the prologue as in the original. Here they are this creepy white ghost, like a young Palpatine, that accompanies you from the start of the game. He's called the Pathfinder, or the Watching One, but he fulfills the role of the Seneschal from the first game. Kind of. One of the major differences of this Seneschal is that from the beginning of the game, he is helping the Arisen accomplish their goal, and this will be a twist later on. This already complicates the idea of the cycle, because are we a special Arisen, the first to receive this additional guidance from the Pathfinder, or is this something the Seneschal always does, because it seems unfair and confusing that they dedicate so much time and help to your Arisen, to us, when the cycle is meant to be a filter for reaching the Seneschal. But here he is, Jedi mind controlling people all over the place, and the game doesn't communicate what this entity is until the very end. The purpose of the cycle itself isn't explained in the good or bad endings of the game, are we meant to defeat the dragon and face the Seneschal? We're made to believe that we can simply take the throne, but does that mean that the Seneschal keeps being the Seneschal? 
It's implied that this god's stewardship brings peace to the world once we defeat the dragon. But that would just pause the cycle then? Are we meant to die of old age and times of peace for a new dragon to appear and then make a new arisen? What is even our role at that point? Instead, the game seems to really, really want the player to break the cycle, a very important theme in Dragon's Dogma 1 that ended on the note that the cycle can never be broken, even if we try. But now, years later, in this new chance to tell this story, the team really wanted to go through with it. You're not meant to slay the dragon and rule in peace. You're meant to slay the dragon and yourself. And this leads to the true ending where the cycle is truly broken in this act. I except it isn't. There's many ways to look at this. For starters, we're never told how the cycle works. Instead, we are told of the greater will. And the greater will seems to represent the natural order of things, a careful balance that the Watcher maintains. We're also never told that Arisens become dragons, but from how dragons constantly refer to you as their silent-hearted kin, I think there's a case to be made for Arisens being dragons just as much as there is for that having been cut from the cycle. But if there's no cycle of becoming dragons or substituting the Seneschal this time around, it still wouldn't matter if the Arisen and Dragon both die. The Seneschal just has to make a new dragon to maintain balance. But we're meant to believe that doing so, that slaying the Arisen and the Dragon with the God Sway Blade does, at the very least, completely offset the balance of the Greater Will in a way that is unrecoverable. And we just have to take that for what it is, without understanding all of the pieces that make up this cycle that we are supposed to break. And if you do this, the water disappears, and a lethal fog falls over the land, as the Watcher chastises you for going against the greater will, asking if what you desire is to rule not over Vernworth, but over the world. The change in water level and fog is the brine, ostensibly taking advantage of the chaos and the balance to rise up and devour all. And the post-game opens much of the world by getting rid of the bodies of water and creating a time-gated mad dash to re-explore the map save the cities of the world, and fight off the fog by defeating drakes and worms. Worms with an O, by the way, not with a Y. Breaking the cycle leads to absolute chaos, as if fighting against the rules of the world makes it the way it is. This is the game's commentary on what true freedom is without the chains of society. A completely new start. Instead of fighting this chaos in pursuit of ruling the world, you fight it to offer the world complete freedom, to save it from the Thing. You know, the Thing, the Greater Will, also known as the Thing, which, metaphor or not, is a poor thing to really fight against. There's so many changes to the ideas presented in Dragon's Dogma 1, and for a game that's had 12 years to rethink and refine its core concepts, the end result is still half-baked, half-explained, and meaningful only if you find meaning in convolution. The ideas of Dragon's Dogma 1 were more concise and better executed than those in the sequel. Even if the idea of the post-game and the world-changing surprise and the inclusion of the brine are all very interesting, as are some of the other large surprises in the game. The final explanation is that in this version of Dragon's Dogma, the dragon is the one who holds the cycle within him, created by the Watcher, which is, you know, informed by the Greater Will, in order to create a perpetual cycle of destruction and rebirth. And by breaking the cycle in this way, which for some reason breaks the cycle, the world can now continue. The Watcher wanted you to break the cycle so that there would be no more dragon and there could be eternal peace. But you, instead, create complete freedom. I really did try to find logic and meaning in the story of Dragon's Dogma 2 and especially its conclusion. I delved deep into understanding if maybe this was an expression of Buddhism, or Sintoism, or Christianity, or a mix of cultures. I wanted it to be deeper than I thought, to be better, but I couldn't find anything. One of my bigger problems with this though, and the crazy changes and big surprises in the game really make this problem worse, is how the game's aesthetics fluctuate even more than they did in the original. I personally find the visual design of Dragon's Dogma 2 to be a bit of a mess. It attempts to create a low-fantasy grounded world, which it follows in its more sparse 
sometimes bland world design. In Dragon's Dogma 1, the only hint of the truly fantastical came from the Seneschal, which felt of a different realm in the Everfall. But Dragon's Dogma 2 is a tale that ties in much more high fantasy elements. The drakes everywhere, the grand towers with magic elevators, the huge stone colossi leaving the sea, the underwater kingdom rising from the ocean, the forbidden magics. It's all just a bit too high fantasy, particularly in how much magic is used in society. The research lab or the golems or the magic elevators and doors. I can't describe this vibe more accurately than slightly more Final Fantasy, whatever that genre might be called. Magic punk? Maybe it's proto-magic punk? Am I allowed to coin terms or do I need over a certain number of subscribers to coin terms? The magic goes completely off the rails in that ending twist sending the whole kitchen flying high with the ingredients reaching maximum airtime, and it's a shame that so much of the game falls into underwhelming vistas and locales when it could have leaned in harder with this magic identity it pursues more and more towards the end. It could have given us fascinating, truly creative vistas instead of reinterpretations of classic fantasy tropes that fit in Dungeons and & Dragons and honestly are a little bit too tame for D&D or Tolkien. I don't know, what's a C-tier low fantasy magic universe? Aragon? Do people still like Aragon? Or am I going to get 50 angry comments for saying that? The post-game does introduce two extra enemies with the Purgeners and the Leap Worm, and gives you plenty new areas to explore and loot to find while battling against an extreme density of difficult enemies, turning even the simplest, most straightforward path into a combat gauntlet that could make a dungeon blush. It's a big surprise with interesting changes, but it wouldn't be Dragon's Dogma if it didn't step on its own feet. This entire section is time-gated. Firstly, you must close the red beacons for the fog to stop consuming the land, and failing to do so as quickly as possible, or even just resting to restore the party, can have parts of the map disappear to the fog. Once you've stopped the fog, you can take on the end of the game at the Seabed Shrine, which ties in the former Arisen Rothian and the Brine in this huge quest to save the world, and you might think that you're free to do this whenever you want, leaving you to explore this new version of the world at your leisure, but you can't. Even with the fog stopped, you have 12 rests before the game ends, so you either carefully manage items in order to heal up, or you're under pressure of having 12 possible rests before the end of the world. Not even here does the game give freedom, instead wanting this to function as a final challenge, an opportunity to gear up before New Game Plus. But on the game's terms, not on the player's. And it culminates in an ending that is less satisfying than the original, and to me even sours the high points of the surprise twist of this unmoored world in the post-game. It ultimately leads to a game that, by choice, never has you ask questions and never provides answers. The world is as it is, because it is. You're never motivated by the story to explore or progress, but because it's the only thing to do. I could twist this into some way that the game is creating a meta-commentary on fate and the role of the player in a video game, and I'm sure people will try to spin it this way, but I just think it's aggressively mediocre and ill thought out. Like they had an end goal for the story half written, and they neither finished writing it, nor did they have it impact anything else in the world beyond the existence of the Watcher, the Arisen, and Phasus. And then it tries once to say something, to tell a story very similar to one that the same team has told before, but to end it, instead of with the nihilism of the original game, or instead of the more interesting way that the DLC with Bitter Black Isle expanded on the ideas of the Arisen and the roles that we must play, it ends by telling you that the most important thing is free will. And if you like this story, I think that's great. There is a nice message to take from this, but I feel like it butchers what wanted to be a complex web of systems and characters and a grandiose high concept story, and it reduces it to we had pieces in play and landed at this message that has been told a million times before in other stories that have been better told. In Dragon's Dogma 1, 
The ending is a giant, inelegant lore dump that ties the theme of the cycle and the roles into the world and the characters you've met. In Dragon's Dogma 2, there's only hints towards what it all means, and we can't even infer that the meaning is the same as it was in the first game, and there are no attempts to tie the two games together. It's a shame, and like much of the downward spiral that this entire game is, it's an experience that lies somewhere between disappointment and wasted potential. That wasted potential goes beyond this confusing mix of vision and inspiration, strange design decisions and half-finished ideas, or the contrasting tones and hostility towards the player. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a broken game at its core. It feels pulled in five different directions and unfinished in all of them, adding so much without ever perfecting any of it, to the point that even the shining parts are dulled by that lack of direction and failure to polish the basics of an open world. And it doesn't double down on the greatest parts of Dragon's Dogma 1, leaving behind the intricate dungeon design that brought tension to the original game, to fit into an open world that finds new ways to fail. The game can't be fixed with DLC or updates. There are too many issues that are integral to its core design. I don't doubt it will receive a DLC that does focus on its strengths and creates a unique, satisfying experience but it won't fix what exists. Sure, an eternal fairy stone to infinitely fast travel like what was added in Dragon's Dogma 1 could help, and some tweaks could make the game more palatable. We could even get a huge dungeon or new region with tighter mechanics focused on combat and exploration, but it won't fix what's already here. It's poetic, isn't it? That this game would follow in the footsteps of the first, down to the letter. Don't get me wrong, Given time and context, I think Dragon's Dogma 2 will be viewed as a worse game than the first overall, even if it is better simply by being so much more modern. But it's a game that's just as divisive as the first. It's a game destined to be remembered fondly by a group of people that like it despite its many flaws, and a game that most people will be confused at or antagonistic towards, with those left in the middle finding a decent experience that is otherwise forgettable. I find myself in the first camp. There are many things I loved about this game, but I can't ignore its flaws, nor can I recommend it without that huge list of warnings that I hope this video has provided. As a huge fan of the original game, this wasn't a fun game to dissect. This wasn't a fun video to make. I wish this game were better, so I could praise it more or go against the grain of criticism and defend it. Honesty is something that I value very highly, and something that seems to be disappearing more and more in the world. And I always want to be as honest as possible with you. Yes, you watching this video right now. When I make these big analysis videos, I always set out to dissect and analyze games, looking to explain what makes them special and worth talking about, for better or worse. And while I started this video with that intention, the reason I finished it is because I wanted to lay my thoughts to rest and find some closure. Releasing this video is my way of leaving Dragon's Dogma 2 on the shelf, and even if I think about it from time to time, I won't pick it up again. There's so many games to play, and so many videos I want to make, and there's nothing I love more than making videos and music, but I much prefer making positive videos, thought-provoking videos, and not videos about how disappointing something is to me. I still hope that this video made you think, that it helped you understand what this game is for so many people, and if you're one of those that found themselves conflicted about this game, I hope it also offered you some closure. If you want to join me on more adventures, there's plenty of videos already up on the channel with the analysis ones being grouped under the long-form analysis playlist. And the best way to catch everything I do is to subscribe. I want to thank the producers of this video, Mika and Islar. Islar also helped edit the script of this video, since it was really tough for me to figure out some of my more emotional thoughts on this game. If you want to join that producers club, there's only one tier for my Patreon. One dollar, and that helps support 
these sorts of analysis on all the videos I make. And I also want to thank you for watching. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, leave a comment with the word ladder in honor to how many times we've all had to hear the pawns talk about every ladder in Vernworth. I'll make sure to heart every single comment that does so. At this point in time, I'm still hearting comments from videos posted seven months ago where people still leave them, so. And hey, while I'm here, might as well tell you, there's some really big plans for the channel. A lot of these long videos coming out soon, so get ready for those. And thank you for the support. I've been Mug Thief, and as always, I'll see you again very soon.